Thank you so much, Aruna, for the introduction. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, and um, truly honored and privileged to win this award um, and to be here with you today. I want to start by making a confession. I am a big fan of Harry Potter, which is where the theme th song came from. Um, and the reason is because I love magic. From the very first time I read uh, the first book, I fell in love with it. I love the ability of using magic to um, make things that are seemingly impossible. But as much as I love magic, I'm also a pragmatic realist. Um, I've grown up in wars, having uh, lived in uh, Lebanon uh, before I moved to the US. And when you grow up in wars, uh, you learn to be a realist. Um, I've shared two anecdotes uh, which seem to be very different from each other. Loving magic on one hand, growing up in wars on the other hand. But there is one thing that brings them both together, and that is the power of dreaming. Dreaming of making magical things a reality and dreaming of a better future. And the technologies that I want to share with you today came out of my personal journey of trying to bridge together both of these dreams. They started by imagining new possibilities, inventing technologies to make them a reality, and then trying to put them to use for positive impact on the world. And one thing that all of these technologies share is that ability to decode hidden worlds in our environments, inside our bodies, in our oceans, for our health, through our robots. The first technology that I want to share with you is the one that I started working on during my master's thesis at MIT. I came to the US. Uh, can we please advance the slide? I came to the US in 2011 to join graduate school at MIT, and I joined the group of Dina Katabi. At the time, the group had been working on cross-layer wireless networks and had developed a deep understanding for wireless networks all the way down to the physical layer. And so I was involved in a number of projects, and, uh, but when it came time to work on my master's thesis, I wanted to choose something that was magical. And that is how I thought about the idea of using Wi-Fi to see through walls. Now, the original idea was uh, a bit crazy. I wanted to take, um, for example, a wireless device like my phone, point it at a wall, and uh, use the wireless signals in order to see on my screen what is going on behind the wall. And I remember going to Dina and sharing the idea, and she was as crazy as I was and told me that I should go for it. Now, of course, we thought that it might be possible in the sense that we all know that Wi-Fi signals can go through walls, which is why you can get Wi-Fi from another room. We also know that wireless signals reflect off different objects, um, and that leads to phenomena that we understand in our community, like multipath or certain types of noise. But does Wi-Fi have the sensitivity to be able to detect people behind the walls that we did not know? And that's what made the project both exciting and magical. And so over the next few months, uh, I started working on the project, trying to get it to work, had many ups and downs, mostly downs, uh, many late nights trying to come up with new algorithms, programming software radios, uh, reading the signal processing literature, until I finally got our earliest prototype system to work. And so we went ahead and uh, we wrote a paper, which at the time we submitted to Mobicon. Uh, this is the paper. The title of the paper was called See Through Walls with Wi-Fi with an exclamation mark. And in the introduction of the paper, we did not shy away from the real motivation that we had behind the work. Let me read the first two sentences for you. Can Wi-Fi signals enable us to see through walls? For many years, humans have fantasized about X-ray vision and played with the concept in comic book and sci-fi movies. And after we submitted this paper, it actually got in, um, and it was accepted. And up until now, I really loved this paper for many reasons. For one, it was my first, first author paper in graduate school. But probably more importantly, it was the first time that I was able to build a technology that transformed something from magic or science fiction into a reality. And over the next few years, while I was very excited about this project, I really wanted to advance its capabilities and make it more and more practical and realistic. So let me show you a video of our next generation prototype. So in this video, uh, this is the, the device that we built. We put it 
uh, behind the room, uh, in, behind the wall in another room. And in the bottom left, you see the output screen of the device. Notice the red dot on the screen because it tells you where the device thinks the person is at every point in time. Now, as I play the video, you can see how accurately the device tracks the person. Even though they have no device on their body using entirely wireless reflection. And the spiral on the ground is only there to show you the level of accuracy. Once you can track people using wireless reflections, not only can you get their locations, but you can also track their body parts and allow them to point uh, to control appliances just by pointing at them. So for example, over here, my uh, collaborator, Zach, he's pointing at different appliances to turn them on and off. And because the device works through walls, even if you leave a room and forget to turn off the light, all you need to do is to point in the direction of that room. And as I said, this was done using a device that is on the other side of the wall in the adjacent room. Um, we published the paper in NSDI at the time, and the reason this work was important is because on one hand, it built on over two decades of research in our community, where researchers had been localizing people using wireless devices. But what it did for the first time is that it showed that you can achieve accurate centimeter scale localization without requiring a user to carry any device on their body. Now, at the time, the research actually um, caught a lot of attention. It was in the popular press. Uh, many researchers were both very excited but also skeptical about the extent to which this would work. Does it work as well as it does in the video? And so I remember building a real-time demo um, for people to try it out for themselves. And uh, we showcased it at the MIT Wireless Summit. So people could go in and try it. And one of the person who tried it uh, is Victor, Victor Ball, who is the founder of Mobisys and of Sigmobile. And I remember after he tried it, he, uh, he went into the room, walked around, saw it tracking him. He said, you know, I like the paper, but seeing is believing. And over the next few years, we kept developing the technology uh, in many different ways and advancing it. So, uh, for example, uh, one of the things that we did is we extended it to track multiple people, as, for example, you're seeing in the video here. In the bottom left, you see the output screen. It localizes the two people who are sitting down. When someone comes in and starts walking around, it is also able to localize them accurately. And all of this was done using a wireless device that is on the other side of the wall that is locating people in the environment using wireless reflections. Now, this was exciting, but it was only localizing people as dots in space. And it was still not as far as the vision that I had of being able to see through walls with wireless signals. So the next step was, can we take this and build a device that can image people through walls? And to do that, we expanded it with phase arrays and with algorithms for computer graphics, and we built the next generation system, which you see here. So it transmits a signal, which reflects off the person's body and goes through the wall, it comes back. And we collect different measurements at different points in time. So for example, uh, this is the output um, at a single point in time. It's shown as a heat map. The background is in navy blue and different body parts are in red, orange, and yellow. And as the person moves, it uh, collects measurements over time and it is able to stitch together a silhouette uh, that captures uh, to some extent how the person looks like. So you can see, for example, over here a skeleton with the person's head chest, arms, and feet. Now, around the same time as we were building this ability to image through walls, I was wondering whether we could also still track people who are sitting still. So for example, many of you here uh, in the audience are sitting and you're not moving a lot. And the question was, can we still locate people who are sitting down? And as we explored this question, we realized that not only can you locate people, you can even track their breathing and their heart rate. So let me show you a video. Uh, over here, the device sends a wireless signal, measures its reflection of the person's body, and to the left, you see the output screen of the device measuring the person's uh, breathing movement, so the inhale and the exhale. And when the person holds their breath, like now, you stop seeing these large movements. And the reason is that when they hold their breath, they stop impacting the wireless signals that are around them. And so when they will release their breath in a bit, you will start seeing these variations happening again.
And so to show this more visually, I will take this video and play it at five times the speed. And as I do that, I want you to try to look at the signal and try to match it to the person's chest. It's always weird to talk about myself in third person, but that's how I looked like when I was a graduate student. And we kept digging deeper to see what is the smallest movement that we can extract. So for example, um, if we take, uh, we had demoed actually that a project at uh, Mobicom in 2014, um, and we also showed uh, more than that. So this is a sample signal. You can see the inhale and exhale as the peaks and valleys. And if we take in this portion over here and zoom in on it, you see small movements on top of the breathing pattern, and we realize that these correspond to the person's heartbeat. And the reason we were able to capture that is that when the heart pumps blood, it creates a force that acts on different body parts and causes them to vibrate, and we were able to capture these vibrations using wireless reflection. Which leads me to one of my favorite applications that we had built at the time, which was a baby monitor. Over here, um, actually this is the output of a baby monitor. If you look in the top left, you see that time is passing, but when you look at it, all you see is a still image. And so we took this device, we took this baby monitor, and we augmented it with the output of our device. And when we did that, we were able to get the baby's breathing. Uh, you can see here the inhale and exhale, and also be able to get the baby's heart rate, which is around 126 beats per minute. And for those of you who have, who've had babies this age, you know that this is a normal heart rate uh, for infants. Building on this capability, one of the things that we did next is we started thinking, can you use wireless signals to recognize human emotions? Now that we can get breathing and heart rate, over the past two decades, three decades or so, there's been this field of effective computing that used vital signs in order to recover uh, people's emotion. And so what we did is we brought together these two fields and built a device that can recognize human emotions. Now, this, caught the, this technology caught the attention of uh, the producers of one of the biggest uh, American sitcoms at the time who decided to create a whole episode based on it. So let me show you a clip from that episode. You know, I just read that a team at MIT developed a device that helps people read human emotions. And you think we can get those guys to reprogram Sheldon? Cool. <laughs> it's supposed to be accurate like 85% of the time. Wow, I find that hard to believe. That a bunch of awkward scientists with no social skills would invent a machine to do it for them? I take it back, I believe it. I think we've heard enough. Um, Beyond reprogramming Sheldon, the ability to be able to sense emotions is actually important for diagnosing various types of diseases like a depression or bipolar um, and so on. Now, around that time, we had also realized that the technology has enormous real-world potential. And so we started exploring commercial applications specifically in the healthcare space. And we participated in a number of entrepreneurship competitions. And eventually, that led us to uh, the White House where we, were, where we were invited to demo the research to President Obama. Now, um, there's many anecdotes that I have from the White House visit, but let me share one of them. I was the subject of the demo, and so the device was measuring my breathing and heart rate. And if you go and check out the video, it is still available online, you'll see that my colleague, Zach, at some point, uh, he starts laughing and he puts his hand on his face to hide his laughter. And the reason he was laughing is because me, the subject of the demo, my heart rate was 110, <laughs> uh, which made sense because I was demoing to the president. Now, the good thing about it is that it was really good practice because when I was doing my faculty interviews, I did this demo in each, uh, each one of my interviews, so none of them were as stressful as the White House demo. And so what started as a magical idea of uh, trying to see if we can see through walls over the years developed to enable wireless sensing of people's locations, gestures, breathing, heart rate, emotions. Um, our research, um, we ended up commercializing it through a startup which is um, quite active today. Uh, it is being used to monitor uh, thousands of patients with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, even COVID-19. And it uh, led to commercial impact. Today, there's many discussions on incorporating these technologies in next generation Wi-Fi, um, the discussions for 6G, as well as it influenced a number of products that are already on the market today. Now, as a faculty, I also continued exploring this line of research. So by the time I had graduated, we had shown that you can get a person's average heart rate. But what I wanted to see is whether we can extract entire heart recordings using wireless reflections. And the basic idea was the same, that you transmit a wireless signal and measure its reflections of the person's body. And what we had shown is that 
not only can you get the average heart rate, you can extract entire recordings. So you could know uh, when the microcardiac events, when different heart valves are opening and closing, entirely based on the reflections that um, come back from the person's body. And so uh, we, it, we can also achieve very high accuracy, about 98 to 99% in tracking these microcardiac events. And we also expanded the technology in different ways. So we expanded it to um, enable motion robustness in everyday environments, and we also showed that you can use it to detect people's stress levels, again, by relying on wireless signals and by accounting for different uh, factors in the environment. Another thing that I started doing um, as a faculty is that motivated by our success in sensing the human body from the outside, I was interested in moving to sensing the human body from the inside. And part of the things that motivated me was um, a demo that happened at the World Mobile Show where a man received an under-chip implant uh, live at the show. So it was basically an RFID right under the skin. Um, and you can imagine having one there is not very useful. In fact, someone else who got uh, a, an under-skin uh, implant wrote, my implant is both less scary and less useful than you might think. And that makes sense if the only thing that you're using it for is identification and if just on, under um, or uh, right at the scan. But what we wanted to do is we wanted to take microchips like this one, which have no batteries, and we wanted to put them deep inside a body and be able to power them and communicate with them from a distance outside the body. And the way this worked is that we build these devices that transmit power that goes through the human body to power up these micro implants and then have them transmit their information to outside the body. And the reason we wanted to do this is because it enables so many applications in digital medicine. So you can imagine a network of sensors inside the body that are continuously monitoring my um, in-body vitals or my gut microbiome. So in the future, um, for example, one of us can take a sensor if we're exposed to a disease, um, like a, in a future pandemic, then it can tell, tell us that early intervention allowing us to quarantine right away. Another application is in long-term drug delivery. Today, when we, people take pills, you envision that they release the drugs inside the body. But there's been a lot of interest in um, releasing drugs over an extended period of time. Or if someone forgets to take their drugs, being able to send a signal uh, to trigger the drug release. Uh, and so that is another thing, uh, that is another application for in-body uh, microimplants. And there's many others for wireless and battery-less microimplants. The problem, however, is that existing mechanisms uh, could not work from a distance outside the body and inside deep tissues. And so along with my group, we've been developing uh, technologies that can remotely power up and communicate with wireless, batteryless, and intelligent microimplants. One of the main challenges that we faced um, in developing these technologies is that wireless signals attenuate exponentially fast inside the body. So if you were to transmit a wireless signal from outside the body, as it goes through different tissues, it's gonna attenuate by thousands um, if not more times faster in the body than in air. And it, the tissues also impact the harvesting efficiency. And this is why existing methods cannot power up battery sensors in deep tissues from a distance outside the body. And it got us thinking about ways that we could power up and communicate with deep tissue implants despite uh, attenuation and complexity. And so to do that, we've been developing um, different types of techniques that overcome these challenges. So on one hand, we've been developing beamforming technologies that are safe and that can power up implants anywhere inside the body. And on the other hand, we've also been building microchips ourselves uh, that can adapt to the surrounding media and reconfigure themselves inside the body. Now, I don't have time to go uh, in depth into all of these technologies, but the one thing that is common across them is that we brought adapt adaptation across the entire chain. And what I mean by adaptation, I mean it from outside in the beamforming, but also in the design of the physical layer, the Mac layer, even in the design of the hardware itself and reprogrammable antennas. Uh, so let me show you one of the uh, devices that we built over here. You can see my student, uh, Mohammed uh, carrying it. It has a microchip. Uh, we built it into an IC and fabricated it on a programmable, flexible antenna. You can see it can be rolled into a pill form, uh, or it could be, uh, it's stretchable, so it can be uh, laminated on an organ. Uh, and the chip was actually uh, pretty powerful in the sense that it could do energy harvesting, transmission, uh, transmitting and receiving, uh, power management, uh, frequency tuning, and so on. Um, and we showed that you could 
the power consumption is extremely low. It's something of the order of 350 uh, nanowatts. Um, and yet it can achieve, you can scale it to achieve throughputs of around six megabits per second, and it can adapt the surrounding tissues. One of the most important things about uh, what we did is that this led to the first successful demonstration of far field wireless power and communication with battery-less micro implants in deep tissues inside living animals. So in collaboration with doctors at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital, we actually tested this, um, these technologies in real animals, uh, specifically pigs, and showed that you can actually deliver power and communicate inside deep tissues. And looking ahead, this is only the beginning of the possibilities of what can be done uh, with deep tissue battery-less micro implants. So you can envision things like locating sensors as they move through the body, stimulation, drug dosing, uh, and so on. But of course, once you start being able to get sensor data from inside the body, this raises many security and privacy concerns. So what if someone has access to the data that is inside the body, and how do I secure it on these battery-less microchips? And so recently, we've also brought uh, modern cryptography to these uh, micro implants, which was uh, a, a paper that we published earlier this year, where we showed that using the harvested energy, you can also encrypt the data and ensure only authorized access. Um, now, so far in this talk, I've told you about wireless and sensor technologies for the environment and for health. But I promised that I will also tell you about how we decode hidden worlds um, in other places. And so, Next, I want to move to telling you about how we build wireless and sensor technologies to decode the ocean. When I started as a faculty, I wanted to work on something that could contribute to addressing humanity's existential crisis, uh, which is climate change. And as I looked into um, climate change research, there was uh, one fact that astonished me. And that fact was that more than 95% of the ocean has never been observed or explored. 95%. The ocean plays the single largest role in the world's climate system. And yet we have so little data from the ocean. We know less about the ocean than we know about the far side of the moon and about the surface of Mars. And so we started thinking about how we can build an internet of things and bring it to the underwater world. If we could, for example, deploy sensors, then we can start monitoring and getting data for underwater climate change monitoring to be able to monitor temperature and pressure uh, and um, temperature gradient patterns and understand how humans are impacting the ocean. Um, bringing an IoT to the ocean can also has an enormous, uh, uh, enormous applications in scientific discovery. Scientists estimate that nine out of 10 of marine organisms have never been observed or explored. Since most of life is in the ocean, it means that we have not discovered most of what is alive on this planet. An ocean IoT can also help in, uh, food, se in food security. According to the United Nations, the world's uh, fastest growing food sector is aquaculture. One in every three people in the world rely on the ocean as their primary source of protein. And seafood farming or aquaculture is expected to fill in the gap between supply and demand for food over the next three decades. An ocean IoT would allow us to deploy sensors, monitor aquaculture farms, and respond to environmental hazards. And there's many other applications, including uh, robotic navigations, weather and climate, defense, and so on. And yet, despite all of these applications for uh, ocean IoT, less than one in a million of the Internet of Things is underwater, even though the ocean covers more than 70% of our planet. And so this got us thinking about how we can deploy an IoT for the ocean. But as we started doing that, we faced a big problem. And the problem was that the battery life of underwater sensors is extremely limited. As we dug deeper into the problem, we realized that the reason is that even the state-of-the-art low-power underwater transmitters typically consume few watts, and they cannot be recharged easily. So for example, if my phone runs out of a battery, I can just plug it in at the end of the day. But if a sensor that is in the ocean runs out of a battery, I need to send a research vessel, pay $50,000 a day to replace its battery and come back. And because of this, state-of-the-art sensors for continuously tracking um, marine animals could only last for a few hours or days, after which their batteries die. And this makes it very difficult to use them for long-term climate sensing or for understanding migration patterns uh, of animals. 
And as we started thinking about ways that we could reduce the power consumption of underwater uh, communication, that led us to developing a technology that enables underwater backscatter networking. And as many of you know, backscatter is the lowest power communication technology. Uh, it consumes net zero power. And by bringing it to the underwater world, that allows us to uh, build batteryless sensors that can last for a very long period of time. So let me explain to you how underwater backscatter works by, by comparing it to traditional communications. In underwater environments, you typically, for example, have a drone or a submarine or a ship or even a base station near the shore that wants to communicate with a, with a number of sensors. Now, for simplicity, let me just focus on one sensor. For those of you who are not familiar, you cannot use Wi-Fi or Bluetooth underwater because RF signals, um, which they use, decay exponentially in water. And instead, you have to rely on sound. So in order for the sensor to transmit this data, it needs to encode it using sound. So it has a speaker, and the underwater drone has a hydrophone, and it transmits the signals using sound. The problem with this approach is that acoustic transmissions consume a lot of energy and drain the sensor's battery. In contrast, in our technology, the sensor does not need to generate its own sound. In our approach, both the speaker and the hydrophone are at the drone, and our sensor simply has a, a mirror or an acoustic reflector, which you can think of as a mirror. So when the drone sends uh, a sound, it reflects off this acoustic reflector and comes back to the hydrophone receiver. And now that I can reflect signals, I can also control their reflections. So for example, the sensor can uh, switch between reflective and non-reflective states. And by switching between these two states, it can communicate bits of zeros and ones, which allows it to encode any messages in binary that it wants to send. So in comparison to underwater uh, traditional communications, where the sensor has to generate its own uh, acoustic signal, which drains its battery, in our mechanism, the sensor reflects an existing uh, acoustic signal, uh, which saves its battery. Now you might be thinking, but what did I do? Didn't I just move the power consumption from the sensor to the drone itself? And the answer is yes, but that is exactly what I wanted to do. Now I can make, have a massive deployment of sensors, make all of them battery free, and I've moved all the power consumption to a privileged location that has its own power source. Now, all of this is great, but there's still one question, which is, how can we control the reflections of acoustic signals? Our idea was to use piezoelectricity to design programmable acoustic reflectors. For those of you who are not familiar, the piezoelectric effect refers to the ability of certain materials to transform mechanical energy to electrical energy. So let me explain it through an example. Let us say that you have a piezoelectric material, and you try to measure the voltage across its terminals. And let us say that you have a, a speaker which transmits sound. Because sound as a travels as a pressure wave, when it reaches the piezoelectric material, it causes it to vibrate, and that generates a voltage or an electrical signal. So it transforms a mechanical signal, which is sound, to an electrical signal, which is the voltage. But remember, what I wanted to do is to use this material as a reflector. And so to do that, all we did is we added a switch across the terminals of the material. Now, when the switch is open, it behaves freely the same way as before, and um, it transforms uh, sound into an electrical signal. But let us see what happens when the switch is closed. When the switch is closed, the two terminals of the material are connected to each other. And when they're connected to each other, you cannot have a voltage. So you have an incoming acoustic energy, but the material cannot vibrate. So where does this energy go? It has to be reflected back. And so by closing the switch, we're able to transform the material from an absorber to a reflector, and we're able to encode using backscatter. Now, of course, what I described here is a, a high-level description. In reality, what you have to do is you have to control the radar cross-section or the impedance uh, um, of the uh, switch. And we call this technology piezoacoustic backscatter because it uses the piezoelectric effect in order for it to backscatter or reflect back acoustic signals. But one of the key things about this technology is that our sensor needs a million times less power than state-of-the-art low-power underwater, modem, underwater motors. It consumes something of the order of 20 microwatts. And not only that, our sensor can also harvest energy in its non-reflective or absorptive state, which allows us to make it entirely battery-free. 
So let me show you a video of uh, one of our earliest experiments that we ran in a large experimental pool on MIT's campus. At the far end of the pool, you can see a hydrophone receiver and a projector, and here's our sensor that is connected to a circuit which has an LED. Now, as I play the video, notice how the LED lights up, even though the sensor has no battery. It lights up entirely based on the harvested energy. Next, let me show you how we are able to decode the sensor's response. So we measured the backscatter signal using the hydrophone, which was at the far end of the pool, and I'm gonna plot the amplitude on the y-axis as a function of time. And this is the signal that we get. At around two and a half seconds, the speaker starts transmitting, so you see a jump in the, re the received signal. And at around three seconds, you start seeing ch changes between two different states because the node starts backscattering. And some of you might be wondering, why doesn't the signal goes all the, go all the way to zero? The reason is that, remember, the speaker is always transmitting, and you're getting the interference of both. Uh, now, of course, what I described is uh, the basic idea, and we built on it with different algorithms and techniques to extend it to many nodes and deal with uh, different reflections in underwater environments. Uh, here is one of our earliest prototypes as well. You can see we fabricated and 3D printed uh, our transducers. One of the things that I will say is that sometimes I get the question, how do you know in which direction you need to reflect the signal back as a mirror? And the thing to keep in mind is that the mirror is only an analogy. Uh, actually, the piezoelectric materials can backscatter in all directions. You can make it, for example, an omnidirectional, and that makes it independent of the way the signal is coming in. We also developed the hardware for energy harvesting, bidirectional communication, and for integrating with different sensors. One of the other uh, important things about this technology is that in comparison to oceanographic equipment, it is pretty low cost. So if you look at oceanographic equipment today, they cost something of the order of thousands, more usually, usually tens of thousands of dollars. And this whole node that we built uh, cost about uh, $100, and at the same time, it consumed extremely low power, which was orders of magnitude than state-of-the-art low-power modems. And building on this basic uh, idea and technique, over the past few years, we've been developing the technology in different ways. So for example, we've been developing different fabrication techniques, bringing ideas from acoustic metamaterials, which are, have developed over the past um, uh, few years in the mechanical engineering community to enable ultra-wideband underwater backscatter. We've also been extending the communication, uh, bringing techniques like MIMO, which uh, many of you might be familiar with, full duplex and FDMA to extend the range and um, increase the throughput. Uh, we've also shown that you could use these for underwater localization. Similar to how Wi-Fi and cellular do not work underwater because they rely on radio signals, GPS also does not work underwater because it relies on radio signals. And so you can use these, these uh, nodes as a way to localize, for example, in, uh, if you want to do marine animal tracking or robotic navigation. Recently, we've also shown that you can bring um, low-power AI to uh, batteryless underwater nodes. And uh, we've also shown that you could build a whole batteryless underwater camera using our technology. Now, I don't have time to go into all of these, but I wanna choose, I wanna show you a couple of uh, our recent results. So after we had shown that you could sense things like temperature and pressure, which are very important, uh, we wanted, to, we started being greedy and we're wondering whether we can build an underwater battery-free camera. So let me show you a video of uh, one of the, uh, our results. Uh, over here to the right, you can see our underwater measurement setup. Um, which is entirely batteryless, which has an imaging sensor, uh, an active illumination, and an underwater object. And um, to the left, you can see the received and reconstructed image. Here I wanna note three things. First is we had to use active illumination because uh, in underwater, sometimes you have dark environments, especially in the deep sea. So you can't rely on, for example, previous batteryless cameras, which uh, rely on existing light. Second, state-of-the-art low-power monochromatic sensors, the uh, um, CMOS sensors that are on the market are monochromatic. And so we had to develop a multicolor active illumination mechanism in order for us to be able to recover color images. And third, you saw that the image was being reconstructed in chunks, and that's because of the memory limitations on uh, the underwater sensor and also the bandwidth limitations on the underwater acoustic communication channel. Next, let me show you some of the results that we got. Um, over here, you see an image of an African starfish uh, that we were able to recover. You can see it with the different colors. 
You can also see an image of um, a plastic bottle, which my students, uh, Saad, Walid, and Osby, uh, imaged in uh, one of the lakes in New Hampshire, uh, in New England. Uh, so this was pollution that they were able to image in the wild. And this result here shows the growth of a plant. So what we did is we got an underwater plant, we got a seed, we planted it, and we monitored its growth over multiple days. And this is a pretty remarkable result because if you remember with the, mo the motivation that I started with, it is very difficult to monitor things continuously over an extended period of time today because you're worried about the batteries running out. Once you make the whole system batteryless, they can, then you can start deploying it over an extended period of time and start monitoring underwater environments. Another uh, recent result that I want to share with you is our work on bringing uh, low-power AI to uh, batteryless underwater sensors. Over the past few years, there's been many advances in tiny ML, um, low-power ML, edge ML in our community, uh, and we were thinking whether we could bring these advances uh, to underwater battery-free machine learning. And one of the applications that we were very interested in is whether we can recognize different marine animals based on their sounds. So uh, we collaborated with researchers at Imperial College uh, with Hamid Haddadi's group, and uh, we built an early prototype of a system that tries to measure sounds of underwater animals and recognize them. And our early results are uh, promising. We showed over 85% accuracy in identifying marine species without any batteries. And this is um, a, a, an exciting result because it means now we can start deploying these sensors uh, in the ocean, having them understand migration patterns and maybe discover new species whose sounds we were never able to record before. And while all of these um, capabilities are exciting, it's only the beginning of what we could do with underwater backscatter. So we've shown that you could reduce the power consumption from by uh, about a million times, from few watts to microwatts. But as I also told you that our group builds ASICs, um, which I see is, and through our early circuit level simulations, we've shown that you should be able to, if you build this on an IC, then you can bring it down to the nanowatt power levels. And if you bring it down to the nanowatt power levels, you can forget about making it batteryless, put a small battery, and have it last for two decades. Um, we've also been collaborating in, with researchers at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in order for us to extend the range to, to kilometer scale distances so that we can start doing offshore monitoring or deep sea monitoring. Uh, in the context of localization, uh, there's many uh, opportunities in underwater robotics or uh, tracking marine animals, and there's many others um, that I, told, that I told, told you about, whether it's aquaculture, climate change monitoring, uh, defense, and so on. Um, and uh, here uh, I'm showing you a video of two of my students, um, Osby and Jose. One of the hard but also exciting things about this, doing this type of research is that you have to actually take it to the wild and test it uh, in the ocean. So you could see them over here uh, testing a few of our, um, of our sensors. Um, here they're uh, extracting a battery-free sensor that can measure temperature and pressure. And one of the exciting things of this technology extends even beyond our planet. Scientists recently discovered extraterrestrial oceans, for example, in Saturn's moon Titan. And over there, it's even more important to be able to operate in a battery-free manner. You're even more energy constrained. And so we've been in discussions with NASA scientists into how we can incorporate this technology into future space missions. Uh, and because of the uh, potential of the, the technology for uh, massive underwater uh, sensing and for advancing our, our understanding of ocean research, uh, last year it was named an ocean shot for the decade, which is basically a moonshot for the ocean uh, by the US National Academy's Committee on Ocean Sciences. Uh, and uh, there's only so much that we can do, and so uh, we've been collaborating with researchers um, to scale the impact of ocean IoT um, across different institutions. We've also um, open sourced all of our code, all of our schematic, all of our tutorials. It's not easy to build these end-to-end -end systems from the fabrication to the hardware and so on. So we have step-by-step -step tutorials, and they've already been used by researchers um, in Norway, in the Red Sea, in China, in Australia. And I've been working on, at the intersection of um, oceanography and computer science and mobile systems over the past few, uh, few years, and I realized that there's so much potential. So uh, in 2020, I went to the National Science Foundation, and uh, I asked for a grant in order for us to organize a symposium that brings researchers uh, from different fields. So 
We organized uh, the Smart Oceans Conference uh, in 2020. It had 1,700 attendees uh, from more than 400 institutions. And because of the success of this conference, uh, the National Science Foundation announced a new uh, accelerator program, uh, which was about $40 million to accelerate bringing these two fields together. And so with this, I've told you about our wireless and sensor technologies to decode hidden worlds around us, uh, in our oceans, for our health. In the last part of my talk, I wanna move on to telling you about how we've been building these technologies for robotics applications. Here you can see a photo with uh, a few of my uh, co-authors for a paper that is actually coming out uh, later this week in uh, RSS. But before I tell you about our latest advance, uh, I wanna tell you about why we started working uh, in this space. Over the past decade or so, uh, the robotics community has d demonstrated amazing advances with computer vision, allowing robots to see things and understand them almost similar to how we humans can see things and understand them. And so we started thinking whether we could give robots superhuman perception to allow them to see things that we humans cannot see. So for example, uh, we wanted to be able to answer questions like, um, what is inside a closed box? Or um, is the food or medicine inside the closed uh, bottle safe? Uh, or can a robot fetch items that it cannot see? And to answer these questions, our approach has been to augment robots with wireless perception. As is clear by now, uh, radio frequency signals can traverse occlusions. And so by augmenting robots with wireless perception, uh, we can extend their perception beyond line of sight and allow them to see things that are invisible to the human eye. So let me show you one of our uh, demo videos. Over here, uh, you have a robot that wants to extract a target item that is under clutter. The robot has a camera on its uh, wrist, but uh, the camera's line of sight is blocked. So if you look from the camera's field of view, it cannot see the item. Um, so what we showed is that you can allow the robot to navigate around obstacles uh, towards the item, even though it originally could not see it, and then go ahead uh, and pick it up. And the way we did that is that uh, we leverage RF perception or wireless perception. Over here you can see antennas that are on the table. Um, we tag the item of interest with an RFID, and um, using the antennas we were able to localize the items in 3D space, so they transmit a signal, uh, they use the response, the green dot tells you where the antennas think uh, the item is um, exactly in 3D, and this was based on a result on, of centimeter scale um, RFID localization that we had in Mobicon 2017. Uh, and now, if you look at the camera's field of view, even though the camera does not know, uh, uh, does not see the item, the robot knows where it is uh, because of its RF perception. And so knowing where it is, it can start navigating. It uses its camera to move around obstacles. Now it goes on top of it. It knows the item is there. It does not see it. So it goes ahead and it removes whatever's on top of it um, and takes it to the side because it knows that it is there. So even if though, though it does not see it, it will keep searching for it. And now it's, it's able to see it. It's this uh, green block that has an RFID on it. And that allows it um, uh, to be able to recover uh, the item and determine when the grasp was successful. So we published this work in ICRA, and in our paper we describe in details how uh, we incorporate RF perception into the robotic control and weigh it um, uh, by the uncertainty of the environment. And one of the things that we did not like about the system is that the antennas were separate on the table from the robot. So we thought about whether we can find and grasp uh, using a single fully integrated robot without a separate system for localization. And so in our second system, we went ahead and we mounted the antennas on the robot's gripper. And uh, over here, I'm gonna show you a video where the robot is trying to recover a key uh, that is under the pile. Again, the robot has a camera, but the camera's field of view is blocked. So you cannot see the key uh, from the camera's field of view. So the robot moved around in order for it to locate the item. And then once it locates it, it declutters, it declutters, it removes what is on top of it, and then it is able to go ahead and pick up the item. And we also showed that you can operate in many different environments and in very complex scenes. So for example, over here, it's trying to recover a remote control, and it is able to remove complex objects like clothes um, and like, for example, a pouch. And then here now you can see the remote control. It sees it, it picks it up, it has an RFID on it. 
And uh, once it picks it up, it can hand it over to my uh, PhD student, Tara, so that she can watch her favorite TV show. Uh, and the way we did this is by developing our visual reinforcement learning um, networks, and we demonstrated that they can achieve very high accuracy across a number of different environments. In one of our most recent results, what we showed is that you can extend this ability to efficiently extract non-RFID tagged items. And this is also a pretty remarkable result because over the past two decades, we've shown that you can localize items when they have an RFID on them. But what we showed over here is that the mere presence of a single RFID tagged item in a pile makes it much more efficient to extract all other items in the pile and make the, the whole task more efficient. And uh, this research was named by, uh, as one of the top AI trends to watch by the Wall Street Journal last year and one of the 103 ways that MIT is making the world better. Uh, it opens up many different applications. In the future, if um, grocery items are tagged with these three cent stickers, you can imagine automated um, grocery fulfillment uh, or multi-robot coordination uh, in manufacturing or uh, different types of warehouse automation for uh, e-commerce fulfillment. Um, and uh, we w we've been uh, developing this research over the past uh, five years, over the past six years, including about a couple of years for translational research. Uh, recently, we co-founded um, Cartesian Systems to commercialize uh, our research on RF uh, ID microlocation with RF visual fusion. I co-founded it with one of my alums uh, over here, Isaac Perper, and we're working together uh, to bring the technology to the world. And so with this, I've told you about our research on inventing wireless and sensor technologies to decode it in worlds. Um, whether these are the worlds, uh, whether for the human body, uh, in our oceans, um, or through robotics. And I've also told you about some of the papers that we've published, and then how we uh, um, endeavor to deploy these technologies in order to address problems, whether it's in healthcare, climate change, and automation. And a lot of these um, were possible because of our collaborations, whether it's with medical doctors, oceanographic institutions, uh, with the National Science Foundation creating new funding programs, uh, or through uh, the startups that came out of this work. Uh, of course, none of this would have been possible without my amazing group of uh, students, uh, postdocs, who you can see over here. Uh, of course, we built things so you can see each of us carrying one of the, uh, the different uh, systems or technologies that we've built, and uh, we work together in order for us to think about how we can um, translate something that is magical uh, into a reality and then de deploy it into practical systems. I wanna wrap up by saying that I feel very privileged to be part of this community. And there's many reasons for this. First, uh, the people in the community are kind and very supportive. Yes, uh, sometimes we get aggressive or harsh reviews. I've gotten my fair share of rejections. Uh, but at the end of the day, the senior researchers are uh, very supportive, and I hope that I will be as supportive to junior researchers in the field moving forward. Uh, the second reason is that the community is open to new ideas and applications. Uh, applications is part of Mobisys, uh, and so that makes it uh, a great place to be. And the third thing is that this community values building real systems. And for someone who dreams about magical ideas, building real systems is the way to see their dreams becoming a reality uh, by seeing them in the real world. And so with this, um, I wanna thank you all for listening. If any of you are uh, interested in any of our papers or our videos, there's a QR code in the top right that you could use for, for all, all our links. Um, thanks again, and I'd be happy to take any questions.